Okay, ready to proceed, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone to November Health in Hackney. Um, I've had apologies from our Director of Public Health, Dr. Sandra Husbands, um, but we're um, ably assisted today by her deputy, uh, Chris Lovett. Um, I'll just go through a few matters of housekeeping and then we'll uh, crack straight on with the agenda. Um, please be aware this is being live streamed on YouTube. It's also being recorded. Uh, press um, generally watch the meeting. Um, please could I ask all microphones um, uh, switched off unless you're speaking. Um, please keep um, your cameras on if you can. Um, I won't be looking at the chat function, say, for anybody just asking if they want to ask a question or not. So please don't um, start conversations there. If you need to get my atten attention, I I either just put question in the um, chat function or raise your hand. Um, and um, with that, um, I will um, go on with the agenda. I haven't been notified of any um, declarations of interests. And so, therefore, um, to go straight on to the, the first item is item four on the agenda, which is um, COVID and care homes. Um, we, we're grateful to be joined by a number of people um, today um, on this area. Um, um, Denise D'Souza, who's our um, Adult Social Care Director of Hackney. Diane Jordan, who's the manager of Acorn Lodge, which is Hackney's largest care home. Uh, Adelina comes Harina, who's a uh, prof professorial research fellow at LSE, who's been looking at um, international data, um, amongst other things, on this area. And also Simon Bottery, um, who's a senior fellow in social care from the uh, King's Fund. Um, and I was going to ask each of those in turn to maybe speak for and also in Hackney of the um, significant impact uh, COVID had in the first wave and I think certainly in the northwest in this wave we've seen um, uh, again a certain degree of um, uh, fatalities in care homes so I suppose one focus of this is really for us to test ourselves and challenge ourselves as, as a local authority are we doing everything we can um, to mitigate the spread um, of COVID in this wave in care homes and what can be learned, what can we do better? So um, first of all, can I ask Denise uh, D'Souza, our um, Director of Adult Social Care to speak. You've got a very helpful presentation, uh, Denise, in the agenda pack. So Denise, over to you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm not planning to go through the, the slide deck, but I've got a, a short brief, but I suppose I probably want to start by saying, um, obviously this is a really important subject and, and I'm sure you will, uh, as we are going to be talking about deaths in care homes, just a reminder that the, you know every one of these is, is, is a person and somebody's loved one, and obviously we'd want to send our condolences to to all of those people um, and families that have lost loved ones. And I suppose the other thing I wanted to say um, very personally, having managed care homes and provision in in my distant past, um, just the sterling work that the sector has done to support people through this time and what's been a really difficult time. And I don't envy anybody that task. So I just wanted to say that um, first of all but I think what I want to do is to give you a bit of contextual in information really so what what we need to what we do know that happened in Hackney there were 20 Covid related deaths in care homes um, in Hackney that occurred around the April May period um, and across the North East London region uh, there were 216 Covid related deaths um, I think what we need to also do is to put this into a bit of context for Hackney because I was quite surprised when I arrived um, at the beginning of at the end of April that, that we have only got 16 CQC registered homes with a total of 331 beds. Only four of those homes um, are, are, are care homes uh, for older people um, registered to give nursing care, and that is a total of 200. And, my, my eyesight's going at this time of night. Sorry, <laughs> 200. <laughs> get the numbers right. 226. Um, so that's a very small number. And if you look at some of our neighbouring boroughs, like Islington have 48 care homes and Redbridge have 43. So we've got a, a, quite a small number. So therefore we do have a number of people that are placed out of borough. And currently we have about 86 people 
place out of borough um, so just we also so you know the main aim within adult social care is to keep people as independent as possible and obviously where possible for them to remain in their own homes um, so whilst that's that's our ultimate goal we do have people that go into residential care and we also have a range of uh, supported housing um, both some of that provided internally and some externally where people uh, move into and, and have individual packages of care so just to, again, so that sort of set, hopefully sets the scene and, and obviously we can take any questions a bit later on, but also what happened on the 1st of September, there was a, a policy, a, a new policy. We've had a, a sort of arrangement around discharge to assess for some time, but what came in um, was uh, Home First. Um, and and the, the, the whole idea of Home First, and probably needs to just make sure people understand this, is that um, in the, on a ward round in the morning, patients are identified who, who could go home that day um, and where possible, they then go into the discharge round and, and, th and then are discharged that day. I have heard some people s describe that as you, you might be in a bed and then the next morning, so, yeah, that morning somebody gets, comes and says you're going home a, a bit later on. That's my understanding is that is definitely not the conversation. There would have been conversations in the days leading up to that person going home on that day about getting them ready to go home. And approximately 50% of the people that are discharged um, go home um, with, with uh, minimal support. Um, and, and there are basically four levels of how people go home so that they're called pathway zero, they don't need any support. And then depending on the level of need, we've got one, two and three. Um, and as I say, most people go home, some, some might need a bit more support. Um, the more complex ones might be people who might be homeless or can't go home to the, back to their own home for a number of reasons. The other change that also came in is that the NHS, well, there's new funding from the NHS that pay for that first six weeks of care. Um, so somebody's been discharged and then during that period at home, adult social care uh, and, uh, and others will go out and carry out that assessment and then decide what the long-term package is for that individual. Uh, so as I say, discharge to assess has been around for quite some time, but, um, but there was a, 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 but there's a real push in terms of uh, home first and, and, uh, and making that happen. But I think it is clear to say, isn't people just being told first thing in the morning uh, and it coming as a bit of a shock and a surprise to them, they're going home. Um, and then just looking back and thinking that was what some of the challenges were when again when I arrived here one of the big ch challenges that were, was perplexing everybody was the lack of PPE um, and the difficulties with with uh, getting that and the delivery of that we also know it's been well documented the the lack of testing in hospital um, and the lack of testing that we have for, for, for care staff because I'm talking about care staff here um, and, and residents um, Lots of concerns about staff and their own health and well-being was also a key issue and, 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 and trying to manage that with rising levels and covering of sickness um, and need, the need for maybe agency of staff or pulling additional staff and the cost of additional PPE. Um, some homes closed for admission because of infection rates um, and there was an, an, a, not an ability to carry out some of our continuing health care assessments at that particular time as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that there have been some some changes since then. So I think hopefully now with the with the national portal in terms of PPE, that's that's eased a lot. Uh, there were lots of grant grants, and we were we were being drip fed grants and and, and and passing those on to providers in terms of uh, grants to improve uh, infection control. Um, uh, we talked about home first and, and care home, and a national policy on care home visits as well as obviously the national nhs tracker on care homes so we do get uh, regular reports about the, both staffing levels vacancy levels uh, rates of infection um, across a whole range of providers so that's a that's a welcome tool that we we now have but just locally i think there's been and and people have Lots of people tell I me mean, it was evident when I arrived that the way in which people were working um, together uh, and there was a lot of support and a lot of building of good relationships, whether that be uh, with our statutory partners, but also uh, with our providers in the voluntary sector as well. And hopefully that will build on, on some of those part, part, partner relationships going forward. Uh, there was obviously training for staff. Um, we were able to, to give providers a 3% uplift for three months to cover off PPE initially from um, March to, to April. 
um, and, and obviously, as we say, we've now got the PPE through the hub. Um, we've been working on a, a, a program in terms of uh, winter, our winter plan um, and obviously testing of, of all patients prior to discharge to care home. So that's something else that's now happening. And obviously there's support from our colleagues in the primary care networks um, and an, an enhanced offer to um, to our care homes. And what we do, do know within the neighbourhoods alignment, um, care homes have a, a GP clinical lead in place. So there's been some improvements, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a snapshot of um, what what's happened and, and where we are in happening. Thanks, Denise. I'm sure there will be some, some questions in due course, but um, thanks for that very helpful um, overview. Um, can I now um, ask Diane to speak, who's the manager of Acorn um, Lodge. Diane, we're very grateful for the work um, that you and your staff did and have been doing and continue to do. Um, can you give the committee and us all some flavour as to how it, how it was in March? Did you feel supported? What were some of the challenges? Um, and, and from your perspective, do you think things have improved and do you feel supported now? And is there anything else you would want from us as a local authority? Over to you. <laughs> okay. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we went into lockdown on the 16th of March and there were a lot of, a lot of unknowns, I think, for everybody. And the, the whole issue around um, infection control and training all the categories of staff so that we were all up to speed on what to do and when to do it and how to do it was, was a big challenge. But, um, and obviously accessing PPE in those first, probably six, six weeks was a challenge as well. Um, I think the other thing too was um, becoming more, as clinical um, staff, becoming more competent in recognizing very quickly not only the, the, the classic signs of, of the virus, but also the more, um, the more obscure signs that at that time hadn't been identified so clearly. Um, so that was a huge challenge for us. Um, keeping the family informed. I think there was an enormous amount of enormous anxiety, you know, um, almost without any notice, uh, the whole situation had changed for them where they weren't able to access to visit their relatives and their loved ones. And that became a, a major um, challenge um, to manage their fears, their anxieties, um, to reassure them that everyone was well and and if they weren't well, to keep them informed. Um, and I think also just adjusting, um, dealing with the advanced care plans, specifically for uh, residents who were coming to end of life and how that was going to impact on the family involvement. So certainly it was a difficult time. Um, I think the first six weeks for uh, care homes and certainly for our care home, we were pretty much um, getting with it. Uh, there wasn't a huge amount of support out there. We were doing the best we could and we certainly um, we, what needed to be done was done. I think in addition to the challenges around keeping the residents safe, it was also about my staff and managing who needed to be isolating, covering shifts, making sure that we could continue to provide the care that was needed. Also, I think the speed of transmission of the virus was was for us something new and and recognizing that and putting putting um uh, things in place to be able to deal with that as quickly as possible um we had really close support from our gp and that was really really so valuable because he was available on a daily basis so that i could troubleshoot with him and he could and he guided and supported the very very difficult early weeks 
um, I think also it was complicated by the fact that there was no testing. The first lot of testing that was done in our nursing home was uh, the second half of May. And so, but by then we were more confident in the way we were doing with the pandemic. We had, a, in, we had already then isolated a specific unit where we would place the discharges from hospital so that it was easier to cohort, to contain the staff, to put in the necessary equipment and supplies that were needed to be able to do this. Um, and so from a management point of view, that just made it much easier to manage. And obviously my staff um, purely were volunteered to work on that unit because there was still a lot of fear and anxiety around um, the whole transmission issue with families to do with my staff. So, and, and interestingly, a lot of my staff had no problem caring for, for residents who were coming from hospital because um, they would come to us with a COVID test being done on the day of discharge, but we wouldn't have the results for 48 hours. So they would automatically go on to the COVID unit and be cared for there and isolated there for the 14 days until we knew um, conclusively if they were positive or negative. Um, and so that continued all the way through. I would say that um, now, um, with the potential of the second wave coming, the systems are in place, the processes are in place, there's sufficient PPE, um, the testing is happening on a weekly basis for my staff and every four weeks for all my residents. And if any of my residents um, display any, any symptoms, we do a test immediately on the same day. Um, and we ensure that they stay isolated until the re results come back. We don't mix the units with regard to staffing or the, or the residents. So essentially everything has been contained in bills on each of the units. Um, visiting has been probably one of the biggest challenges is because the need of the families to see their, to see their loved ones. So we have been very closely um, following whatever guidelines there are. So we, we, at the moment, we have a mix of um, window visiting, a lot of Zoom um, video conferencing, and we also, especially around our unwell residents or residents coming to end of life, then we risk assess and ensure that one or two members of the family are able to come and see the residents. So we are, we are, we are now ready for the second wave. And uh, I, I don't think that uh, it's not that it wouldn't be a challenge, but certainly there's a confidence and a surety around providing the care. Denise, um, no, for Di me to Di cover, Di that's Diane. No, Diane, that's an incredibly helpful overview, and I'm sure the th thank you very much, and thanks for, again for, for everyone's very hard work. I'm sure there'll be some questions um, in due course. Um, can I ask now? Move on to um, Adelina uh, Comas Herrera um, from the LSE. Adelina, I, I've seen some of the, the the papers you've done on um, international comparisons um, with other countries. Some of the data that stuck out, you know, Singapore. I think uh, two um, uh, fatalities or passings away in care homes. Hong Kong, none. Um, can you can you share some of your experiences on on looking at that research and also from your perspective on on from the, the UK, are we now doing everything we can and, and should be doing? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the sad news is that Hong Kong has had some fatalities since the <laughs> report you saw, but, but very few. And I think it's very important to look at the share of care home residents who died in different countries and, and understand the impact. Uh, what, one thing we have found out, and, and I don't know whether that's good or bad, is that the, 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 the share of population who, who died in care homes, so the share of residents who died in care homes, is almost perfectly correlated to the share of people who died outside care homes. 
And what that is saying is that despite all the, and that's mostly from data from the first wave, although some countries have had ongoing waves. And that's telling us that despite the very best efforts, it's really, really difficult to keep this virus out of care homes. And uh, I, I really applaud everybody's efforts. And I think they're absolutely worthwhile. We also know and we're learning, for example, that outbreaks can be contained. For example, the cohorting in a special unit that they had mentioned is one of the international measures that seem to, to have some, some um, impact. And, uh, and I think this, this leads me into then thinking about what works. And I, I think that the principles are the same inside and outside care homes, in the sense that it's all about test, trace, isolate. The problem is that testing has not always been available in care homes, and isolating has been made very difficult because of the infrastructure, because of the characteristics of people who live in care homes, people with dementia who may find it, who may work with purpose or find it difficult. To, to stay in their rooms and or to remember even the instructions sometimes. And then of course the access to PPE and, and barrier and the ability to barrier nursing. So, so there's a lot of logistical difficulties to implement these principles in care homes more than outside. And that requires resourcing. And I think here it is where I'd say we have the, the, the big uh, issues. And uh, a main concern I have is what happens to care homes that don't have a special unit where they can cohort people. So not all nursing homes have a layout that allows that. And from my point of view, in terms of the current uh, policy responses in Britain, this is the area that is less clear to me. How are care homes supported where they, where they don't have adequate space or perhaps sometimes not enough staff because uh, providing care in a cohorting way is more demanding in terms of numbers of staff and NPP and, and so on. So, so I'd say that uh, that uh, we need to address funding, we need to address governance. Um, I, I, we've obviously learned a lot, and then it's very good that some things like access to PPE have been sorted. I think we're now seeing also improvements in testing. It's very interesting to see what will happen with rapid testing. I'd say the isolate bit of the test trace isolate is perhaps the one that would be concerning me most. And then I'd like to say as well that although it's been difficult to measure numbers of deaths in care homes. It has been even harder to measure the numbers of deaths of people who rely on care in the community and to also measure the impact on unpaid carers. We know that there's been a huge amount of excess deaths happening in private homes. These are, because of the statistics, we know that these are very old people. Many of them will be relying on care. Many of them will be self-funders. And it's not clear who's responsible for supporting them. It's, it's not, we're treating them as if they were an average member of the public when these are people with care needs. They just happen not to be funded by, by local authorities. And we have no data on them because they're not under, under that. And again, we have no very little about unpaid carers. What's their access to testing if they don't live in the same household sometimes? What's the access to PPE for them? Who's paying, who's fine, who's, you know, can they have any support with that? And I'd say this is probably one of the big questions that I have about our current situation. And thank you. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. So, thanks, Ali. And that, and ju just before we move on to Simon, can we just so everyone's clear what we mean by cohorting? Essentially, anybody that either has or possibly suspected of COVID being kept in an isolated ward or wing of a, 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 of a care home, is, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, of course, it's a very, I mean, we've learned a lot, it's a very highly infectious uh, disease. That, sorry to say something so obvious, but, but you do, you cannot have people in the same space. And, and, and it's a challenge to do that in a care home. And of course, in private households, in theory, we can do it. But in practice, it's been very difficult too. In care homes, it's even harder. And we need to make sure care homes have the right resources and the right backup if they're not able to offer this. They were not designed to be isolation facilities. They don't, many won't have the, the, right, the right ventilation systems. Many will not have a space that they can convert. And, and if they don't, then we really, really need to, to be offering some alternatives. One thing I'd like to say as well is that we've seen in quite a few countries, especially in Asia, that they have a very strict policy that the minute there is a case of COVID, these people will be moved out or, or suspected COVID. These people will be moved out of the care home. It's a, it's a bit controversial because, of course, it's very 
you know, it affects a lot the person who's being moved, but on the other hand, it may enable care homes to keep the outbreaks to one or two people at most, much more smaller than what we've seen in some care homes where it's really spread. And I think that's also something to consider when, when a care home does not have the, the enough space or facilities or the right layout for cohorting and isolation, whether another place outside could be prepared to do that. Right, thank you, Adelina. Um, can I now move on to our sort of uh, our last special guest, um, uh, Simon from the um, King's Fund. Um, Simon, we, again, we've sort of provided some of the links in the papers. You've done some work on sort of some of the sort of the main structural um, underpinning issues with care homes that existed a long time before and perhaps have been brought to the fore um, by this pandemic. Uh, problems with staffing, um, the, the uncoordinated nature, uncoordinated nature of the um, of the sector. Um, could you share um, some of your thoughts? And and also, I suppose one thought that. that that crossed my mind during during the peak of this is, is surely this would now be a catalyst for a reform of the sector in some meaningful sense. I mean, do, 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 what any any thoughts on that? Any any evidence that the, the policy may be changing in in some meaningful sense? Um, I'll take the first one first. Uh, last one first, if you like. I, I I always quote the physicist Niels Bohr, who said that predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. Uh, and uh, when it comes to social care reform, I think that's exactly where we are. Uh, I, I, it's impossible to make a prediction uh, about what's going to happen uh, next. Um, I, I think, in more general terms, just looking at, uh, I, was, I was trying to think, what what's the most? If, if I was a member of the scrutiny committee, what are the things that I would be looking at? both in terms of the immediate issues and some of the broader uh, issues and I sort of came up with five things there may be more but the five that I thought of would be I think I'd be looking at um, are, care, are our care home residents safe uh, I think I'd be asking are they happy uh, I'd be asking are they in the right place um, are, I'd be asking will our care homes survive uh, and I'd be asking will we be able to staff them uh, in a in a second wave, uh, and if I just touch on some of the factors in each of those, in terms of safety, uh, Adelina has already covered this uh, in more detail, and she's got much greater knowledge than I have. But the sorts of things that I would be looking at would be things like adequacy of testing, how quickly are tests being turned around, those sorts of issues. Uh, I'd keep an eye on PPE, although I think there's a general feeling now that the PPE situation is infinitely better than it was uh, in the first wave. Uh, I'd be keeping an eye on infection control and I'd be looking at uh, cohorting and the ability to, to cohort within individual care homes. So there'd be a range of things I'd be thinking about. Can we keep people safe? I think I'd also be thinking about the tension between safety and happiness. Uh, you know, so there's this issue that, um, you know, we want to avoid risk. We want to make sure that uh, that COVID can't get into homes and we know absolutely how calamitous it is when it does get in. Uh, on the other hand, you know, these are people's homes uh, and, you know, uh, the average length of stay in a care home will be perhaps 18 months. So. You know, this is an important time for people to, to, to live. And if they can't see their relatives uh, and all the, you know, uh, 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 isolated in their own rooms, th then actually, you know, that has a really profound effect as well. So visiting policy and how you handle visiting policy and how you manage that tension. Uh, and, and the government, as you know, is has a pilot uh, which will, in theory, at least allow carers to be tested or a carer to be tested and to, and to, and to visit. I'd be keeping a very close eye on that. And if, if that wasn't going to happen or even if it was I'd be thinking well what else can can we do in terms of are people in the right place one of the things that I think was clear from the first wave uh, was that a lot of directors of adult social services were describing uh, concerns about assessments uh, taking place uh, whether they were whether full assessments proper assessments were, were taking place before people were discharged uh, and if you don't do the assessment the risk is that you actually discharge people to the to the wrong uh, uh, place uh, and then whether there was a follow-up to that and the Red Cross did 
did some very interesting research looking at, um, uh, at what happened to people afterwards. Uh, and a lot of people were saying essentially that they, they didn't get any uh, follow up. Uh, Denise quoted the, um, the, the pathway uh, percentages. I think one of the important things about those pathway percentages is that they're not supposed to be an absolute guideline for every local authority. So the idea that 50% of people uh, won't need any follow up uh, uh, support, uh, it, uh, that isn't necessarily true for individual places. Uh, and you you'd need to think about, well, actually, what's our number, uh, uh, as, as it were? And I know Denise knows, uh, knows all, all this, and I'm sure she can um, uh, you know, sort of fill in on it a bit more. The second a bit about are they in the right place would just be about costs. So again, um, a, a lot of DASs were saying that, um, frankly, when, when, with, um, when the NHS was discharging and paying, there was quite a lot of people going to places pay, uh, paying at rates more than the, the council would normally have, uh, have paid. And, and so there is an on, uh, there's, at some stage, there's going to be an issue there uh, about what you do if you've got play, the people in places who are paying more than you actually, frankly, can, can, can afford. So I'd be thinking a little bit about that. Um, can homes survive? Uh, I'd be looking at occupancy uh, levels. Uh, so the numbers, um, I, 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 these are very crude, but I, I think generally the sort of occupancy level of about 90% seems to be the sort of minimum that homes can typically survive on. Um, the number seems to have dropped, uh, certainly in smaller homes, to about 80-85% per during uh, the, the pandemic, and particularly amongst self-funders, and self-funders pay more. Uh, so what you find is that the the, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, new uh, 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 residents who are council funded that fell by I think about a third. Uh, but new residents who are self funders, those numbers fell even more sharply th than that because basically people said, "I'm not going into a care home. If I'm paying for it, there's no way I'm going into a, into a care home at the moment." Um, so occupancy levels and what happens to them will be pretty critical uh, because it comes on top of this existing fragility uh, and uh, you know uh, and and these compounded by you know cost of uh, PPE. Uh, so so the amount that you're paying care homes, the fees that you're paying, the extent that you're passing on uh, uh, money from from the government, I think is is is, is a critical issue. And then that lastly one about can we staff them? Again, we know that um, when the uh, first wave struck, there were uh, high levels of sickness uh, uh, initially, uh, sickness and isolation uh, 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 in initially. Th those have uh, levelled off uh, and. Um, um, vacancy rates in the sector as a whole uh, appear to be falling. So the sector has had uh, high vacancy uh, uh, rates, about 112,000 at any one time. But actually, what one of the impacts of, um, of, of, of the recession and unemployment is that there are more people willing to work in care. Um, so seeing that you're getting your share of those people coming in and, and, and working would be quite uh, important. Um, and I would also just keep an eye on the uh, on the um, consultation the government's got at the moment which would limit uh, people working in more than one home uh, because that potentially has some impact. I, I tried to do some crude numbers on that but it's very uh, very difficult but certainly that could have an impact on that. So I would look at you know safety, happiness, in the right place, will the care home survive and can we staff them as the sorts of things that I think might sort of hopefully help you through and everybody else through what you know could be a bit of a, a grim winter. Um, Simon, that's incredibly useful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, just before we turn to questions, Chris Lovett, who's our um, uh, Deputy Director of Public Health, one of the slides he's going to show us later on for another item on a uh, sort of standard update on where we are uh, for testing and COVID in the boroughs in relation to care homes. And I, th I think, I think um, Chris, you just, you just offered just to show us this th these couple of slides now, just because it's, it's more contextually relevant. So, Chris, just over to you if I can. And I'm not sure, can you share your screen to show them? So, hopefully, that should be coming through now. Thanks, Chris. Now? <clears throat> it's on its way. Yeah, got it. So, basically, this, this is showing, I think, um, very much in, in, in graph. Sorry? Yeah, we've got you. Yep. So this is showing in graph form, I think, the, the good news that really has been talked about. And what you've got very much there is um, the beginning of the, the first wave. Um, actually, there are probably more COVID cases because we weren't doing a lot of testing at the time. And what you have in the dark green is actually the care homes for older people. The slightly uh, lighter green is the care homes for mental health. 
and then the very light is the learning disability care homes. Um, and what you can see very much is that we we have in the second wave, so if we're talking sort of August, September time, um, we have had much fewer um, COVID cases in the older people's care homes. And that's because of all of the work that we've been talking about, um, improving the, the discharge from hospitals, PPE, routine testing. So I think you can really see um, there where there has been the successes. What you can also see, I think, is that there are obviously going to be continuing challenges in any care home um, and, and the, the nature of a care home for learning disabilities and for mental health is quite different. So there have been a few um, cases of COVID uh, more recently. And then looking at the deaths, again, uh, 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 in, in graph form, obviously those deaths that were um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, and there has been quite a high proportion of the deaths overall in Hackney, obviously in the older care home residents. But again, what you can see is there haven't been um, an ongoing uh, deaths since we've actually had all those interventions that have been talked about. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Chris. Are you, can you, are you okay just to take that down for us, just so I can see everyone? Yep. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> that, that's very helpful for contextual. Um, just, just one thing that I think I'll just pick upon before I throw it open to questions from other members. Um, the, during the, the, the peak of the first wave, I think a few of us were sort of getting weekly updates in terms of um, number of um, uh, residents within care homes who had COVID and people who were passing away who had te been tested for COVID. But then there was also a, a sort of a figure of the number of people that had, uh, that had just generally passed away that perhaps hadn't necessarily got a positive test of COVID back. But what was clear from that is there seemed to be a significant excess deaths within care homes over and above those that are just tested positive and then i think when we ask for sort of like the, the five-year average of, of of deaths in care of, of of those care homes it was a significant um excess mortality so in some ways i, I suppose i just caution and bring out there whether the the sort of the 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 the, the figures that just give the the the, the covid deaths actually necessarily show the full picture um, and I think that's something Adelina sort of picked up on some of her work as well about how difficult it is to measure. Um, j just, I suppose, then arising from, um, before I open it up to members, on Simon's point number one about safety and, and piggybacking on um, Adelina's point about smaller care homes and cohorting, um, obviously Acorn Lodge, where... Um, uh, Diane works they can cohort but we've got another three care homes in Hackney um, Denise are you able to say whether they are able to cohort um, in those other um, care homes and if they're not what are we thinking about doing on, on the safety safety aspect there so uh, yes, excuse me, I don't have an in-depth knowledge, and there might be, Nina might have a bit more knowledge than I do, I think she might be on the call, but I know we've got one home that does feel that it can cohort as well, um, so clearly we, we have to make those arrangements, and as we've been asked to look at designated beds as well, um, that's something else we've been looking at when we've been looking at the designated beds of which CQC will be coming out, are coming out to make sure that they can manage that infection control regime and, and, and cohorting and the like, so Yes, we've got some, um, but we also have a, no a number of other units. We talked about housing with care, we've talked about supported living, um, where sometimes it's much more difficult as well. And what we've been having is conversations with partners about how we can support people to, to self-isolate self um, within some of those other settings. So, you know, housing with care, people have the tenancies, they can come and go as they please. So. Um, having to have very different conversations with people about how they might interact around the rest of the building and some of the other things that we've been trying to do um, as i say work with colleagues both across learning disabilities and mental health as well to to support us in doing some of that but uh, you're absolutely right not all not you know my experience of i don't know happening homes particularly well in terms of buildings because we're working remotely um but what we what we do know the newer builded newer built homes especially some of the larger homes that have been newly built it is probably easier to cohort where you've got uh, residential provision which is often maybe in converted buildings or not built buildings that were built for that purpose then often you would find it more difficult so i think i think nina had a um 
um, hand. hand up as well then to possibly assist us. Have we done a have, have we done an audit across our, our providers in the borough as to who can safely cohort or who can more safely cohort than others and then worked out an action plan for, for the other places? Yeah, so yes, we've had to do that work. So um, within our older adults care homes, so in the four older adults care homes, the nursing homes, sorry, um, two of those nursing homes can um, cohort. That's Acorn and, and Mary Seacole? Or? Correct, yes. Acorn Lodge and Mary Seacole can both, both cohort. Um, and um, we, across our LD and our mental health homes, I don't have the exact figures, but they have all been in, inspected and it's, it's a mixture because we've had to put in place um, contingency arrangements across a, a few of them so that people are not discharged straight from hospital into them. Or, and there's other sort of contingencies in place as well, either through normally through finding temporary identified temporary accommodation um, for those care homes. So we've identified a a block of six um, uh, flats, um, six interim supported living flats that we can discharge um, people into before if if they can't go straight into their own um, supported living scheme or housing with care scheme. Fine, thanks. Um, I, I, I've got further questions, but I want to open it up to um, uh, members. So any, any members on the committee with um, questions? I can't quite, I'm not sure I can see everyone. Cam, I can see you. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Cher. Uh, I just want to uh, find out, do we still have uh, staff moving uh, between homes? Denise, maybe, Denise, maybe yeah, I'm not aware. Uh, obviously, there's been lots of guidance, and I'm not aware of uh, any of our homes where there's staff moving between because they're they're all in they're all individual homes. We haven't got people with with more than one home, um, so the answer to that is no. <laughs> we don't but, have staff moving. But, but in terms of agency staff that would be coming into um, backfill if if there's absences, a week. I, th I think it was Ireland who did it quite early on and I think Simon just alluded to it in terms of the, the consultation that's out at the moment about sort of saying staff can only so in particular it's hits with agency staff so do, do we have a blanket rule across the care homes that agency staff can only be associated with one home I I'm gonna have to defer to um, I don't think uh, my understanding is from the reports that I've seen I don't think that we have many of our nursing homes using agencies that are then moving across but I don't know whether Nina has any more information on that. Yeah so we've given so the, the guidance is that staff should not be working across more than one care home and that's the strong guidance that we've given that come, that's come out nationally and that we've given to our local care homes and that's the kind of we that's the the, the, the guidance that we've given we haven't seen any it's very hard to police so it's very hard to police that down to a you know a detailed level. So we've been given assurance that 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 is in place, and I think I think we have to believe our care homes that that is in place. And when I say it's hard to police, I don't mean the care homes are lying to us. I mean it's hard for them to police as well. Um, but but I think we have to take the assurance that people are following that guidance. And, and Diane, what's your experience at Acorn, at Acorn Lodge, at Acorn Lodge, both in terms of the about, about, about that issue, but how, how practical is it when, when you may be short of staff? Uh, uh, Diane, can you just turn your sound on? You're on, you're on mute at the moment. That's it. Um, with reference to the question about agency staff, we don't use agency at all. So we make with a group of staff that we have um, to, to provide the care and myself and my clinical manager are both registered nurses and at times we've we've done clinical care we needed <laughs> thank you uh, thank you Diane um, are, are other members with questions uh, Councillor Snell. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hayhurst. I, I tend to kick off the questions at this committee, but um, quite often, but I've got too many questions. <laughs> you can shut me up if I go on too long. Um, so, Denise, thank you very much. Uh, your presentation uh, in the committee papers uh, was fantastic. You gave a very brief verbal presentation tonight, but for anybody watching on this, please look up 
that uh, PowerPoint presentation that Denise put together because it's um, it really does set out uh, the, 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 where we're working. Um, there's a question for someone. I'm not necessarily sure who needs to pick it up, um, but I have experience in this area both from looking after my father who died earlier this year, not COVID as far as we know, and my mum who uh, you know is, is, we're looking after. Uh, plus, I am chair of a charity that has a care, it's a strange care arrangement. It's where people pool their uh, private uh, amount to, to live all together. And it's therefore one of the most vulnerable locations. Uh, and we are currently challenging, it's not in this borough, uh, uh, the hospital for not following the guidance that uh, you say you're now following. They did not properly test someone who was discharged. And now this time we avoided it last time we have a, a COVID issue. Um, so when exactly did the r rules come in that said you actually test someone and wait for the test result before you discharge them, which is absolutely crucial. I mean, we all know it's not perfect because people could catch it up, catch it later. But when exactly did those rules uh, uh, come in, particularly given the person who may have introduced COVID into our situation was in a ward that had a known COVID patient. So at any point he could have developed the illness. Um, so, so but when did those rules come in? They're not perfect. They never will be perfect, but they were better than the old rules. Um, the interesting from the other people on the panel, you know, my mum did her own risk assessment and decided she was better off living next door to her sister who's retired GP. And we've been risk assessing like crazy. And it causes huge family tension. You know, when you say to your youngest sister, sorry, the GP and the social workers are saying, please do not visit. And so she doesn't visit him at the end of his life. Um, you know, that creates tension. But we can cope with that. You know, we're a strong family, we'll work through it. Um, but we know our risk assessments. And one of the things we've managed to do is bubble with a carer who is similarly vulnerable, whose husband is similarly vulnerable. And the big weakness, and it's affecting both um, us, because sadly our, our carer has MS and she just had a downturn in the last two days. We will be devastated. We have given her extra shifts, we are making sure she can stay viable, she's protecting her family, we're protecting our family. It's a bubble we've created because we're paying for it ourselves. The worry that we have whenever we've talked to uh, local social services is that they put people in on a rotor, they don't put that dedicated carer. And it's been so important, both for mum's men mental health, but, but also um, we've created a community there, a sort of extended bubble. And, and it's been fantastic and it's kept mum a whole lot better than she would have been otherwise. And that's also affecting, you know, this situation I'm involved with as a charity is that we were worried with a heavy handed NHS app telling everyone, don't go to work from now on because you'll be fined £10,000. And we sort of say, we've got the risk assessments. We've kept people separated. We've had the PPE. We've done all of this stuff. And so the second question and, and by all means, I welcome comments uh, on, on this from other people. My second question is, how quickly can the DPH turn around and say, ignore that uh, uh, rubbish coming out on the uh, uh, national NHS app, which is what eventually happened with us. If you have risk-based systems, prevent infection of your other residents because it would have been devastating for some of the people we look after if they'd lost their carer even though we were running regular testing and regular pp and we'd done the isolation and we'd done all that other stuff you know suddenly having to bring in a load of outside staff would have been far more dangerous we knew that and we just needed to get it agreed uh, and, and from the last point um from the manager of acorn homes we went there a few years ago uh, when we were looking at end of life care I mean, I think you ended up writing a significant number of our uh, recommendations um, and we did respect you. And I think it's appalling that the situation that I manage and that Acorn ho Homes provide. Why did we like it? Because they encourage people to mix and socialise and be close to each other. And, um, and it's a complete tragedy that those are absolutely the situations where uh, uh, people catch COVID if it comes into that environment. 
Um, uh, two questions, really. Number one, could Hackney... Uh, Hackney yeah, Peter, Peter, just give, give us those two quick because I'm running out. I've got, I've got quite a few. Okay, you, so. so number one, could Hackney have done more first time around to get behind you early on? And number two, um, are you going to get through this current... Have I missed this? This current issue that 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 you you put down as requiring improvement in some areas, but not I understand in the care and support that you give to your patients. Uh, when are you going to come out of that? Is there a fast track way of getting out? Because our experience is you were first rate. Um, thank you, Ben, for being so tolerant. No, th thanks, Peter. So, um, if I can, the, the the first question was in terms of when did the rule come in that there has to be a negative test in hospital prior to discharge. Let's see Nina's hand on that. Nina, do you want to go? Um, you, Nina, you're on mute. Yeah, so that was on the 15th of April. So, so the national directive changed that you needed to be tested before discharge to a care home on the 15th of April. But, but, the, guess, but the result back? Um, so it, it, it was vague. So, so it's, it's worth noting, on the 19th of March was when the initial government guidance came out that supported getting people out of hospital as quickly as possible. Then on the 2nd of April, the government guidance confirmed that people did not have to have a positive COVID test before being discharged into a care home, but that the care homes should be able to isolate people or at least protect them from each other. And then on the 15th of April, the government retracted that and said people needed a COVID test before discharge into a care home. That, that, that letter was vague about whether you needed to wait for the result. And can Tr Tracy, from you from the Homerton, what, what do, are you able to say what the current policy is? Are you waiting for negative results prior, or are you waiting for, sorry, for the result to come back prior to discharge at the moment? Uh, ben, thank you. Um, so yes, we are. Um, so the, the patients tend to get tested um, two days before we anticipate um, them being discharged. Um, so with the anticipation that the result comes back, um, all patients are tested. Um, so all unplanned admissions um, are tested anyway. Um, and if there was a um, an extreme example or case where it was very, very strongly felt in the best interest of the patient that um, they should be discharged um, in advance of that test result coming back. Um, we would only ever do that um, if they should be discharged um, in advance of that test result coming back. Um, we would only ever do that um, in discussion and consultation with the home and um, uh, a plan to, to manage the patient. Um, that is not, that is far from normal. I think that's only been, um, there's only been one case or the odd case that that's happened to. Um, now the test results are coming back much more um, rapidly. So um, facilitating patients getting their results before they're discharged. Thanks, Tracy. Um, just on, on Peter's second point, which I think, his second question, which I think, um, really um, sort of dovetails with I think Simon's fifth point about the, the, the staffing issue if, if I've got it if I've got it right from what Peter was saying the, the issue where you have um, a staff member who gets told to isolate or potentially a number of staff members that get told to isolate and then um, that causes significant disruption to say a care home or possibly even a hospital setting um, when they're possibly showing no visible symptoms and what to do and and if you're happy about your risk assessment can you override the isolation warning is that is that right peter have i got it right uh yes thank you ben uh sorry let me uh, uh the, the question is yes you a risk assessment we have a competent risk assessment in place and uh we were worried but the dph eventually came in and said no that's okay and i've in fact written to the chief exec in hackney and said let's be ready for this to make sure that we have that but the key thing is how quickly can they respond because it did have us worried for a day or two it, 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 peter are you talking about in the event that somebody gets told to self-isolate but you're satisfied that, that there have been properly risk assessments in place so the issue is that once you're on the nhs app 
it identifies that you've been with someone who's been infected. Yeah. And then you've got all these staff saying, well, we'd love to come in. We're very happy to come in yeah. and work with our PPE with this patient who we've worked with in some cases for the last 10 years. Um, uh, but we're being told we're going to be fined £10,000. So the key thing was to be able to then go to the DPH and say, have you the power? Can you override this? And as far uh, eventually we got it. But, you know, D Denise, we, are the, uh, Denise, are there the systems in place now for to troubleshoot other such examples such as that? I have to say, I wasn't aware of that, that we could override if, if somebody said, if, if somebody had had a positive to say that they couldn't. So um, my, my, my thoughts were that the guidance was that you, if you, were, if you were, were contacted on an app, then that, that's what you have to do. And you, um, so I probably need to follow that up, that one up with Sandra or, or Chris might be aware of that. Uh, Adeline has just helpfully said in the comment that I, ideally there would be rapid testing to sort of resolve the situation. Yeah. Um, in terms of that, and, and care workers and, and workers have been able, and that's that was again I'm not quite sure of the, the timelines on all of these things, but there were testing for care workers, so care workers then were able to get tests, um, although not as, as I think Tracy mentioned or somebody mentioned earlier, not that the, the results weren't necessarily at that time particularly rapid but you know they are coming through quicker now so they, they would be they would be uh, able to get their tests and that's why the portal was set up so that care workers could actually do that and get those tests so that we could get them back to work thank you denise and just before i sort of ask um um diane just to answer peter's final point denise in terms of something adelina raised in terms of there's been a lot of focus on um care homes and settings but what about people in their private um homes and are we uh monitoring and providing support and ppe um for, for carers in a private setting w what work are we doing in that regard so we've done we've done a lot of work with our home care providers and uh, i think this is something simon touched on as well um so obviously we've been working with with our home care providers um and trying to reach out to those who are personal assistants where people might have a direct payment and might be choosing to provide their their care through a direct payment i think i think as uh, councillor snell um just mentioned though i think there will be a lot of people paying for private care to whom we don't know about um and i think that that's in a way it's a direct payment using your own funding um so we we, we wouldn't be aware of those but obviously we do have stocks of we you know stocks of ppe and we, and, and they we were reaching out to people in order to you know to say that there, there was there was PPE for you know people providing care, um, uh, but certainly you know it is an issue when we don't, we don't know about some of those self funders um, and and I think uh, when uh, Simon was talking earlier I think you know some of those issues around um, self funders and 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 the care home markets something else that obviously as he quite rightly said all directors of adults are worried about in terms of the stability of the market and especially as some people are either choosing not to go into care homes um or not to receive a level of care and i think that's another another area that we've been looking at in terms of uh you know people who might need enhanced care not wanting to have more people coming into their homes thank you just, just while i'm on that just for adelina just on that point i mean do you have sort of any suggestions or thoughts you, you said this was an area that concerned you the most in terms yeah. one of the areas that concerned you the most at the moment any any thoughts or suggestions in terms of um however we determine it self funders and um accessing those people to provide them with ppe whether there's multiple agency staff going in and, and, and that area of concern I think some of these issues are longer term in terms of being able to address them because we don't have a we don't have a system of data that enables us to identify self funders and and to then go and support them when there's a, a an emergency situation like now. But I, I know, for example, that there are people who, for, for example, we can identify that they have a diagnostic of dementia and live in the community and are very likely to rely on quite a significant amount of care. And this is possible to identify through the GP uh, re registers, for example. So I do wonder whether there's a scope for a more uh, proactive um, policies to try and identify these people in this second wave. 
Thank it's you. It's difficult, you. But, but that's where I would start. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Denise, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I think, that, uh, and while we're talking about carers, I think we're talking about the, also those informal carers, so they, they, those family members, and actually, yes, making sure that they have access to um, those people that are providing informal care, absolutely. Um, thank you. And then just um, on Councillor Snell, sort of final two questions to um, Diane from Acorn Lodge as to, I suppose, the, the first one was, did you feel supported by the council during the first wave? And secondly, there's this issue that um, Acorn Lodge, I think some time ago now, was rated as required improvement. But the CQC has said that um, essentially a care home needs to be rated as good in order to be the designated care home of any borough. And how are you working through that? And how are you working through that issue? Um, yes, yeah, so we... Um we had an infection control inspection which was uh, um, as compliant and we um, have now had a CQC inspection um, and we have not yet had the outcome of that um, to continue to be classified as a designated setting um, but in the meantime we are still providing care to uh, discharges from hospital um, because they um, are being tested and even though they may not go on to the COVID unit um, because they're negative they can be isolated in their own uh, bedroom on suite um, on a unit that I can compartmentalize so uh, that will continue until I know otherwise. Um, at the moment, I don't have any COVID positive uh, patients at all. Um, I've had one asymptomatic outbreak, which was back in July. I worked closely with Public Health England around that. And at the moment, all my staff on the testing is are COVID negative and all my residents are COVID negative. Thanks, Diane. Um, I've had um, Councillor um, Gregory um, with a question. So, Councillor Gregory. Hi, thank you. Um, that's uh, quite interesting. I'm fairly new, so um, I apologise if some of the information I'm requesting has been provided in the past. Um, I think with the pandemic, my kind of overall sense of care homes across on a national basis has been quite negative. Um, I felt very concerned for elderly people who were vulnerable and how how they've um, fared in, in terms of um, their general health, but also general kind of quality of life. And bear in mind, we have a small number of um, care homes in Hackney, so that means there's not a lot of choice for Hackney residents. So I wondered how we kind of measured the quality of the delivery, which would then, in effect, help form a view on the safety of those um, of the care homes. So I imagine I, I wanted to go with some sort of table which lists measures that we could see. Um, so, for example, a measure would be um, the number of permanent staff and ratios per um, resident. Um, the kind of if they're on permanent contracts, the levels of pay, um, things like um, are residents uh, do they undertake consultation? How do they communicate externally? I mean, I ask that specifically because in my ward there's a kind of sheltered housing. Whenever I've tried to go there to do any campaigning work, we kind of met with staff who who just block block us and make put up quite a lot of barriers so we can't talk to people. So I. I just um, wondered how people in care homes are able to communicate externally um, and engage publicly. I wondered on the provision of the quality of food, timings of patterns of and the offer of support. Because in a way, I think that's all part of understanding um, the general health and safety, particularly in the pandemic. But on a on a on a a usual basis and I wondered how that compared with other care homes 
uh, across uh, London, for example. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what's actually provided rather than and, and, and the kind of safety elements and whether there's enough resources in the care homes that we do have. So I don't know if that information is readily available, but if it is, I'd like to see it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Councillor Gregory. So, really, really benchmarking and governance and, uh, and cross benchmarking. Denise? I'm sure Diane might want to come in as well on this one, but obviously, all homes are, are registered, as we've just heard, by CQC and are inspected by CQC. Um, and certainly in Hackney, we have a, a quality assurance uh, mechanism. Um, and Diane will know this that um, so people who are working in the commissioning unit. Um, would have in the past, but obviously it's a bit more difficult at the moment um, with, with COVID and not wanting to go into homes. Would have would have been working with with Diane and her team around a quality assurance framework and being being assured about the quality. And interestingly, as Diane will, will, will probably know as well, we supported evidence to CQC in terms of how we we how we wanted to support them in their in their ability to become a designated setting because of quite rightly the inspection. Um, had happened some time ago and we had the quality assurance evidence that those uh, those things that had been picked up um, within that inspection um, had improved from not from what CQC had done but as part of our quality assurance monitoring. Um, I'm sure I could get um, Jennifer from our team to, send, uh, to share more details with you about what that framework looks like. Thanks Denise. Um, can I just, are there any other um members with questions. Uh, Councillor Adams? Uh, thank, thank you. Yes, I, I'm just wondering, with this uh, fa uh, fast-moving um, uh, situation with pandemic, how often do you actually update your risk assessment? Denise or Nina, maybe? How often are the risk assessments updated? So, I'm probably a bit more clarity, but I just noticed Nina's come in. I was, I was going to say, I think um, it's been so through the pandemic. I think the gen so um, Denise talked about Jennifer Solaire, who runs the quality framework, quality assurance framework for all care homes. So her and her team are pandemic. So there's been a lot. Of, so it's the care homes through the pandemic. So there's been a lot. Of, so it's not a case of you know a, a um, so that there is a normal um, update cycle. But I think there's been contact that's been much much more regular than that to the care homes from Jennifer's team. Um, and then there's been a lot more specific work looking at the um, ability to cohort um, patients um, and more detailed look at that as well. So I, I think, you know, there's been kind of weekly conversations with most of the care homes um, throughout this period. And, and, and Nina, just on Simon's third point about people being in the right place, particularly with rapid discharge from hospital, to what extent are we um, um, reviewing, keeping that under review, particularly when there has been a rapid discharge from hospital, to uh, check whether people have been discharged to the right place? Okay, so um, at the moment, anyone who's had... So, um, so, uh, so everyone is getting tested before they leave hospital and that is, ab that is absolutely happening. And at the moment, um, only designated care homes can receive patients from hospital um, that have COVID. So only at the moment, Acorn Lodge can receive patients that um, are, have, have COVID and potentially we're going through the same mechanism to arrange for Mary Seacole to potentially have the same arrangement. Um, and then, as I said, we've got some interim um, supported living um, support in, um, in place for people who don't need care home um, provision, but need to go before they need to go into any other sort of step down care. So, so people are not being discharged into into the general care environment. I, th I think, and Simon can come in here. I think the point was more not not necessarily just. Um, Make, assuring ourselves that say they didn't have COVID but it was making mm -hmm. sure that maybe with the, there being such pressures on the system and being everyone being pulled in every direction that they actually went to the best place for their care. Simon was that the, was that was that your was that your third point? Yeah it was a broader point raised by a number of um, DASs in the first wave um, both about are they are, is someone in the right environment for are they getting you know reablement uh, is in a rush to get people out of hospitals did they end up in the 
right place. And then the secondary point, which was about the cost of, 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 of care and, and that uh, the NHS was, was sometimes paying more than you would normally pay, and sometimes paying more than you would normally pay, and, and just being aware of that as, a, as an issue which may come back to, to haunt you at some stage over the next year or so. Yeah, I think yeah, I think in in equity, diff differing rates of pay is something that we're we're definitely dealing with at the moment, and we need to. There's a certain amount of undoing of some of the and working through kind of the long term financial arrangements for some of the things that we've done and are continuing to do. Um, I think in terms of people being discharged to the right environment, I think that's a good question to ask. Um, at, at the moment, the hospital is so the Homerton is not under significant significant bed pressures is the first thing to say. So bed pressures are, are not significant at the Homerton, though they are in some other trusts in North East London. So BHIUT is experiencing quite a lot more bed pressures. So I don't think we're doing anything rash um, in order to get people out of hospital quickly. And um, we've done quite a lot with our discharge arrangements. So we have um, introduced, there's been a lot of improvements. So we've introduced um, the discharge single point of access which was mandated through national guidance, but has actually been really positive for us. So that's been in place since October, and that's a, a hospital-based hub that brings together all of the different health and social care partners involved in discharge um, and supports um, the home first model where, where a patient can be discharged home and um, the kind of assessment model. And that brings together, you know, occupational therapy, you know, therapists and um, social workers um, and hospital staff and reablement. So, so I think we've got pretty good assurance from that team that people are being discharged appropriately. Um, we don't have very much bed-based provision, as you heard in Hackney, so that, that is a pressure for us and that remains a challenge. And sometimes we do have to place people, we often have to place people out of borough. Um, so, so that is definitely a pressure and doesn't always lead to the, the most ideal home in terms of location um, or the most ideal placement in terms of location. But but certainly, I don't think we're putting people in the wrong place. That's not not what we're being told by kind of colleagues in the de in the discharge single point of access. Thanks, Nina. And um, we've got uh, two minutes left before I'm going to wrap up this item. Um, and I think uh, Councillor Gregory has just asked Denise if we can, if you can, in due course, send through the um, a quality assurance framework um to, to jala so we could look so we could have a look at that that'd be much appreciated i suppose just just to wrap up i mean maybe to adelina and to um simon i think the northwest has so far of the country has so far been the one that's um been impacted the most by the second wave what are we from what you've seen if you've looked into this what are we seeing about the the impact on care homes in the northwest have the steps that have been put in place mitigated um factors or have or, or are on the data are we are we seeing a, a, a number of fatalities a, a, again in the second wave in the northwest i, I don't know if either of you have looked into that do you me too uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's really really difficult to compare this wave with the previous one because of the difference in the amount of testing that what happened in the first wave so we know we know how we saw almost no well, try to know how many people died it's really difficult to know how many people had COVID and didn't die, especially at the very beginning of the pandemic, first few weeks when a lot of the deaths in the first wave happened. So yeah, I don't think we can really say that. But one, one thing we've no, I've noticed recently, uh, we've got a report coming very soon this week, mm -hmm. is that there's the share of deaths in hospital, care home residents, which is reported by uh, from data from CQC, is increasing a little bit. So and and uh, I am hoping that this time people who have COVID and who have uh, significant symptoms with COVID will be more readily admitted to hospital and uh, because we now know that we have uh, better treatments and that even very old people are doing well when they receive hospital treatment for COVID compared to the hospital outcomes we were getting at the earlier part of the pandemic. So I do hope that from a the hospitals hold up in terms of and availability and that there's no discrimination against care home residents that we might see slightly better outcomes. Thank you. And, and that, just to say in generally, yes, we I appreciate that there's been a lot of learning, a lot of much better access to PPE. I think testing is also, although there's still issues, much better than on the first wave. So I think we have some, and we're hoping to see better numbers. Thank you. I, I, I'll quickly pick up that point with 
with, with, with Tracy, but Councillor David um, wants to come in for a quick question as well. So, Councillor David. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just a quick question. Uh, whilst you're getting the quality framework uh, reports, which uh, which has been requested, uh, if it's possible, please double check to find out how regularly the uh, risk assessments are being updated. That that would be very helpful to have a definitive uh, response on that uh, okay. in in relation to all all the different care homes. Yep. Okay, yeah, we can. Thank you. We can. We can. We can. We can certainly ask that. Thank you, Councillor David. Um, Tracy, just on um, Adelina's last point, I think it, th there was some talk in the media in relation to the the the, the first wave that the eligibility criteria or threshold for people to be admitted to hospital under perhaps understandably because the pressures were so great in the hospitals at that stage were geared or set in a way that indirectly meant that residents from care homes weren't necessarily always getting taken to hospital. Um, from your experience now in terms of say if Acorn Lodge calls up and says you know we've we've got somebody who's showing quite severe symptoms um, you know what's the Homerton's policy is it, is it would would it be to to, to take that patient? Um, it, well, thanks, Ben. Um, I mean, it certainly wouldn't be to not take the patient based on any um, form of, I suppose, can only be described as discrimination against people in care homes. Um, uh, there would be a clinical dis discussion and a clinical assessment. Um, I mean, it's probably worth reiterating the point that Nina made that um, we're in a generally fortunate position in that our beds are managed reasonably well we work very well as a system so um uh we 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 haven't got to the position where we've got people queuing up outside and we didn't get to that position during the pandemic either um so all of the patients that um were clinically assessed to need to be admitted um were admitted fine okay thank you um thank you tracy i'll, I'll draw it to I'll draw it to a close there. Can I thank everybody um, um, for, for speaking? That was incredibly informative and um, assisted us both now and in in the coming months in being able to um, scrutinise and question on this area and understand what the uh, and what and what some of the underlying issues are and the questions we need to be asking. So thank you very much. I'll draw that item to a close. Um, I, I guess please don't. Um, uh, Feel like you have to stay uh, 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 please leave and go and enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you very much um uh, and diane thanks very much for all the work you and your staff are doing um, um we very much appreciate it thank you so uh with that i'll draw that item to a close and can i go on to item number five which is the unplanned care work stream um, we've got um nina griffith who's the work stream director and tracy fletcher we've got a um a report in our agenda. Um, we've allocated 20 or so uh, minutes of this. We've already had um, significant contributions from, from Nina and, and, and Tracy already this evening. Um, Nina, did you want to speak to it briefly? Yeah, I mean, just, just to say, um, the report's there. Um, I think it's, it's just worth saying that I, I last spoke to this committee in January, um, and when we were writing this report, I was sort of shocked by how much has changed since January. Um, in so many ways and what we've kind of been through since in that time so obviously since that point all of the health and care partners that we work with in the work stream have been responding to the pandemic um, and in many ways that's thrown up a lot of changes in the work stream um, in terms of the kind of governance structures that we work through the financial um, structures that we normally work through and the kind of how we normally manage our business um, but in other ways, it's also kind of really reiterated the importance of the work that we were doing anyway and um, really demonstrated the need to do this work in terms of the work that we're doing to strengthen our local communities and deliver the neighbourhoods model and um, the work that we were doing to support discharge um, and, you know, support better integrated discharge pathways. Um, and then also the work that we're doing around the front door and the urgent care pathways and to deliver a really good joined up urgent set of urgent care pathways. So, and to keep people away from the hospital where we can and where it's appropriate to do so. 
so you know while the pandemic changed a lot of how we did things the kind of what of what we were doing it really emphasized the importance of doing that and it, it's also given us in, in certain certain instances that kind of um burning platform to get on with some things much more quickly um like the discharge pathways like um new models of care within neighborhoods like new mdt models of care um so we're still continuing to drive a lot of transformation and work around those three, three areas and um, i suppose one one thing um end of life care had always been within the portfolio of the work stream and um this time we put a lot a lot more of our kind of resource and thinking into end of life care and um, just because of the nature of the pandemic and the cohorts of people we were dealing with so we've done a lot more focused work on end of life care and likewise um since the summer time so from summer and into autumn we've always had responsibility for winter planning and we've put a lot more focus into the winter planning process coming into this year into this winter and um, which has obviously been coupled with winter winter coinciding with a second peak in covid admissions so those two have kind of been been seen as quite um, joined items or areas that we can't separate. So I think um, the topics and the things we've been doing are, have really continued to be driven through the pandemic, but the, the way we've done them has been quite different. Um, and I would also say that I think it's, I've been really humbled actually being able to work with so many fantastic health and care partners over this period. And um, people have been really, really committed and put in so much you know, dedication and hard work to support um, residents of City and Hackney to be safe and be as well as possible through this period. And often, you know, putting their own kind of well-being second to to their jobs. So I, I've, I feel really humbled to have been able to work in that period. Yeah, Peter's clapping. I would definitely give a clap as well. Yeah. So thank you. You've got the report, so I'll open it to questions. Thanks, Nina. Yes, and, and, and we, of course, echo that. I mean, what, one thing that jumped out of me you know the, the 111 aspect I mean, we've gone from a situation where we have had a, a sort of a failed private provider eight years ago the gps took it over we had a it was well funded it was a rolls royce service everyone that called up got to speak to a gp a doctor a trained doctor in immense immense confidence in the system i used it several times it kept me and my kids away from a and e on a number of occasions I'm one of those worst people who lives around the corner and so otherwise would just go into the hospital. And now it's been replaced by 111, whereby at best 30% of people actually get to speak to a clinician. You've got this algorithm, you know, and we're seeking to pin hopes on that. You've got stories in the media that came out in terms of wrong diagnosis and not being sent into hospital when they should have done and further undermining confidence. I mean, is, is there a you know, a scope of a real reform to this system that provides confidence. Do you want me to come in and answer that? Yeah, if you, yeah. I mean, it, it's a tough one. I, I think there's a couple of things to say. So firstly, there's a lot of national kind of policy direction on the 111 model at the moment and on the 111 model that we currently do have in North East London, which is the, um, initial conversation with a, an algorithm and then a clinical assessment service if you are deemed to need a clinical triage um, or for certain cohorts of people an immediate conversation with a clinician um, and I think there's a lot of um, national attention going into that there's been national money that have gone into 111 to try and increase capacity and indeed the service have responded well the, the service responded very well during the pandemic so I think in terms of access, they, they did actually do very well. They um, had a kind of shaky start, but then it, it, did, it did get much better. Um, so I think things that you kind of concrete things that you can measure, like access and like the number of people who get clinical, you know, a clinical um, assessment before being sent to hospital, they do pretty well on. But I agree with you, we, we do consistently get the feedback that, it feels like you're talking to an algorithm or they don't quite meet our needs um, locally from people in City and Hackney. I think, I think we do need to keep on working with them to try and make it better. And I think we've got some pretty good structures, actually. One of the things that's changed through the pandemic is we've now got a North East London um, urgent and emergency care group that is actually chaired by Tracy. But we've got that brings together all the partners across North East London hospitals, commissioners, and 111. And that does give us more levers, I think, to work with and improve 111 and work with LAS. 
Um, so I think there's more that we can do with this service. However, um, I am very uh, much a realist about the fact that people, 111 is, we, we, during during sort of day, sort of uh, when your GP is open, I think your GP is a better port of call than 111, and we're continuing to tell people to call their own GP when they can during the, the hours that their own GP is open, and I think that will continue to be our advice. Um, and secondly, um, 111, I think we need to be a bit more uh, better at targeting the right types of people to call and use the 111 system. Because I don't, I think kind of the uniform messaging to everyone, I don't think it will always help everyone. So I think we can be better about that. Um, and I think we have to accept that people will continue to walk to the A&E front door and we have to try and serve them as best we can from the A&E front door and work with them um, to get to the right service that they need from the front door as well. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Nina. I won't. Um, I think I think no. I could I could say other things, but I think I want other people come in. I think John John Williams, did you want to come in? I've got Peter. Yeah, thank thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, firstly, you have been doing fantastic work, and uh, we can only congratulate you for all the work, hard work you've been doing, and how difficult it's been. Because I think you're right; it's a lot has changed over the last nine months, and it's been incredible the way to see people respond. I think I think you know, you know how concerned I am about making sure public involvement remains a key part of the work that you do as you develop new services. And one of the things we have been particularly concerned about is the lack of public involvement because of the speed of the way the services have changed, discharge to assess the MDTs as well. You know, and these are we need to go and make sure we do go back to that ambition that we have of public involvement and tackling the wider health inequalities that we see in the borough. And so one of the things I'll be uh, interested in is see how you're trying to recover those situations, because I think if you don't recover that, we're not going to be carrying carrying forward what we were, our ambitions are. But particularly, I'm concerned about the return of a medical model that seem be, seems to be predominant at the moment. I can understand why, because you have to focus on these things right now. You have to. But we mustn't make that the only way we do things. Look, Just looking at the uh, integrated commissioning emerging partnership priorities, they are very medicalised. A wider ambition seems to have been disappearing from it. As opposed to preventative, John? Uh, well, prevention is still there, but again, prevention is kind of, I feel, pulled back as well because because of the focus on trying to tackle the, the immediate crisis that we have in front of us. I understand that. But if we do lose these wider ambitions, we won't be seeing the transformation that we want to be seeing or tackling the wider issues that we need to tackle in the borough. And it's, I, just, I just think I, just, I don't want to see it lost. That's the main point. Thanks. Um, I've got, I've got, I've only got a few minutes left on this item. So, uh, Peter, I'll, I'll take the questions and I'll go to the answers altogether. So, Peter, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, yes. Um, so, one's legitimate, one's a bit of a chancer. Um, I just love working in Hackney because uh, I'm just so impressed with you guys and the way you work together. So, that's a fantastic report. Coordinate my care. Um, now, I love that. Uh, when we did our investigation, uh, it was care homes complaining that it wasn't working. Um, that basically relatives came in and took people into uh, acute environments uh, that were not what they wanted. And uh, so we absolutely have to check that every single person in a care home, a care environment, has done a CMC assessment. I know the GP Confederation has worked hard on that. But um, I, I, Laura may be in on this call still, but uh, but that has to be the priority given the difficult situations we're in. Um, and I use that to reassure people that we do not send people off to die. You know, so that CMC is absolutely uh, essential. Um, the cheeky question, and so Nina, tell us about that. The cheeky question, Tracy, is that uh, Ben and I are going off to um, in the northeast London. Yeah in uh, in a week's time and um and it was announced at the start of this whole uh, covid outbreak that all nhs debts were being written off we had an issue here where we had a well-run health authority and a well-run hospital that did not have huge debts and we were concerned that top-down reorganization would impose on hackney debts incurred by mismanagement or stupid projects from neighbouring health authorities. So can you just tell us quickly what happened with that write-off of debt? 
So when I go to inner North East London and ask this question again, uh, does that mean that uh, the Royal London and Barts and whichever ones it were that, that got involved in stupid overspends, um, are they going to still impact on the budget for Hackney or, or, or uh, you know, what's the story? Uh, give me a quick summary, please. So just just before trade to so any more questions just on this item before I... Um... I can't see any. So, Nina, do you want to do? Do you can you do uh, John's point on the, the, the over? Is it over medicalized? The current sort of in the medium term, the, the focus of things, and also how proactive we're being on uh, getting as many people care plans and coordinate my care, and then I'll go to Tracy on the finance. Um, yeah. So, so John, um, I think I think John makes a good point that. Um, you know, through the kind of emergency response crisis response to the pandemic did mean that we were moving at such a pace and given the kind of move to virtual working, we, we didn't consult and collaborate with our local residents and with service users in the way that we normally would have. And it just wasn't feasible to do so. And we've now stood back up most of the kind of forums and groups that we had in place um, before the pandemic that bring together local residents. So um, we have uh, the Neighbourhoods Resident Involvement Group is, is now running and working. And um, we have um, a public representatives, for example, on our discharge steering group as well. So we have we are getting back to something similar to what we had in terms of involvement. And um, we're still, the, the bit I'm still struggling with is, is working out how we can do some of the more kind of um, focused involvement pieces in, in the virtual world. And, you know, there was actually a, a CCG event tonight, a winter and self-care event that was a good trial of, well, it was a good event, actually, and that was a good starter for me to see how things like that can work. So I hope I can work with John and his colleagues at Health Watch to get us much better at involving patients. Um, in terms of the um, over-medicalised model, I was quite surprised to hear that, actually, because a lot, I, I, I don't see that in the work that I've been leading. And indeed, actually, I've seen the opposite in some places. So, for example, through the winter planning work, we've been much more focused on we, the winter planning is normally kind of looking at is the hospital ready for winter? Is A&E got enough staff? But this year, as well as that, we've done a lot more of thinking about how to support vulnerable communities and make sure that vulnerable communities are well and ready and supported through winter. So actually, it has taken a kind of broader, less medicalised look. It, but but I, I hear what John said, and I'll, I'll, I will I will reflect on that um, sort of. In, in looking at, at what we're doing within my area on cmc yeah um yeah so we did a lot of work to make sure that care home residents all care home residents should, residents should have a cmc care plan in place and we did a lot of work to make sure that they were all updated and um, before the end of quarter two this year so that they were ready in advance of winter and in advance of a second covid peak we're also looking um to roll out my CMC care planning, which is the, the user-led side of the CMC care plan tool, which we haven't deployed at all in City and Hackney, you know, it, other than on sort of one or two, you know, ad hoc basis. So we are looking for the next phase of CMC is to implement my CMC and make it much more user-led. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Nina. Um, Tracy, on the on the financing thing, was it was it was it hospitals didn't have to meet their control targets? for this year or was it a wider write-off of debt um oh God, right okay so um so the control target issue um to some extent um has been altered as a consequence of um the whole financing regime within this year changing so shift to block contracts um uh the use of covid money coming in um unplanned expenditure um that we didn't anticipate so so this year is 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 very different um i'm i'm barely i i'm, I'm, I'm to some extent i'm not really qualified really to answer peter's question but i think there are probably two points i'd make so firstly there's probably a difference between age debt that people carry over uh, trust carry over constantly and the inability of trust to um, operate within a positive run rate. So, um, and I think there are some trusts who struggle with one or other or both of those issues. Um, so the positive run rate element is, you know, for example, we as an organization are given 340 million pounds, or we, our income is 340 million pounds a year. 
and we anticipate to and we plan to operate within that 340 million pounds some trusts find it difficult to do that within whatever their equivalent of 340 million you, you've is. historically done fairly well with that we have historically done fairly well with that yeah. yes um some pe some trusts some organizations are carrying over um a historical debt that may have arisen um in previous years for whatever reason i think it's my understanding that it's the historical debt element um that there was that was the area that was affected and there was a conversion of how that was treated um taking it out of the the sort of the the, the um the accounting methodology that impacts on revenue and putting it into um pdc which is more of a sort of what does pdc uh, stand for uh, public dividend capital right okay fine now I'm not an accountant and I'm not the director of finance and vote, uh, I'm sure Phil would be able to answer the question better but I, I think that, that 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 that's a broad um um a broad summary as far as I'm aware of it. But thanks Tracy we can pick that up uh, in in a north east London I think it probably just more impacts upon Bart probably in any structure any long term. Uh yeah no definitely. Uh, and, uh, um yeah no it'd be an interesting question to ask and an interesting answer to hear. <laughs> right, well, um, with that then, um, I'm going to um, close this item. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Nina. Um, uh, yeah, very much echo um, Nina's um, um, opening remarks. I think we're all humbled by the, the, the incredible work you've all done. So um, thank you very much, um, and thank you for your contribution to this committee. Um, so I'll close that Thank item, you, Ben. Thank you. And then um, I will go on to item six, which is... Uh, test trace isolate we've got an update from uh chris love it who's a deputy director thank you chris we already saw you earlier on you circulated a new slide pack thank you for going on radio four last week and saying about um hackney's work there and contact tracing so chris over to you so hopefully um you can see here me and also the presentation yeah, um, there's it. 10 slides i think we've just done two of them already so um, I, i'm not going to go through them in huge amounts of detail but um we've got some really good um early um messages here um so there is now obviously as everyone's aware a national lockdown we're halfway through that national lockdown and in hackney this is not the case for all of london but in hackney the number of cases of coronavirus is still high so we, we're certainly not out of the woods but there are some tentative signs that the rate of increase may be slowing. So, and that rate of increase is slowing faster in Hackney than most other London boroughs. So, um, there may be a number of things that account for that. But we, what we are very much hoping is that it is an early signs that the initial stages of the um, the tiers and then also the national lockdown is actually starting to have an impact, and we are seeing a, a decrease in the rate of um increase in uh, covid um there are some worrying uh, signs that the rates for the over 60s um has gone up a little bit in hackney um it was uh, very much higher than london for quite a period um in the last sort of four or five weeks but certainly it was decreasing and now has slightly gone up a little bit so that's really a, a key concern for us because that's where you get most of the hospitalizations um, and the deaths um, and the, the regulations are starting to have an impact um, and we really do need to kind of reinforce that people do need to strictly follow those regulations in order to ensure that our local communities do not continue to be so badly impacted by COVID. Um, so these are kind of the summary of the national restrictions. Um, there is clearly uh, some really good compliance with these. Um, we have got um, uh, some pressure points in, in the borough. Um, where there are, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to uh, prevent the um, transmission of COVID, you really do need to reduce the amount of crowds, the number of people that you have, and where you have got people in, in places like shops, um, is making sure people do maintain that strict social distancing and wearing of face masks. Um, and obviously, we have got the impact of certain businesses at the moment and venues must close. And if they're not complying, then there are fines that have been imposed and the police are very much taking a, a, a much more enforcement-led approach now. They have been doing the engage <clears throat> and persuade for, for a long time now, but we are now looking at much more enforcement. 
So this is kind of that information in a little bit more detail. So um, Hackney is the very light blue, uh, and you can see our cases now. Has uh, It was very much above the London level, getting towards the England level. Uh, and in the last few weeks, so this is an, uh, middle of October to the beginning of, of November, you can see that um, a decrease in, in the, 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 the rates of um, cases per 100,000. The number of people being tested is all slightly below that of, of um, the average for London, but essentially um, it's held up fairly well and we're, we're fairly much tracking the, the, the London and the national trend. And then the positivity, so of those people who come forward for testing, how many of them actually are testing positive? Again, we were quite a lot higher than the London, a little bit higher than England, and we've now come back towards the uh, the, the average rate in, in London. And that that's... Um, essentially quite good news as well. Um, and then where are the most of the COVID cases being diagnosed? Um, so that is uh, getting a slightly older group. So before, so last uh, two weeks ago, it was mainly um, in the uh, 20 to 29s and it's slightly going up into the 30 to 39s. This is obviously where we are um, always gonna be slightly concerned as to if it continues to go up the age range that's where you get those difficulties. Um, and as you can see um, just here, the incident rate um, for the over 60s um, is about 120 per 100,000 compared to 100 per 100,000 in the previous two weeks. So that's something that we are um, concerned about. Chris, just out of interest, is that spike in that age group um, any coterminous or linked with them being parents of children in school? Or you can't, can't you extrapolate that? There is a little, I mean, we, we can see some of that here, actually, because obviously what you've got now is in a lockdown, um, there were quite a proportion, I think it was about 20% um, of all the cases prior to lockdown were kind of uh, in pubs and um, hospitality venues. Um, and what you're seeing on this next slide, actually, is um, if, if you had seen this uh, two, three, four weeks ago, is there were much more dense red spots and those dense red spots are where you're getting clusters now you're still getting a number of clusters in hackney but what's really interesting is if you just look over the border into tower hamlets there's still quite a lot more clusters here and these are often associated with the uh, student halls of residence um, or, or certain very specific outbreaks so um, i think what you're probably finding for the um, uh, the increasing age is it may be intergenerational households but it may also just be people being um, exposed in uh, where there are large groups of people coming together. Um, so what we're seeing here, I think, is um, previously this was a very much a sort of north-south split in Hackney. Um, the deepness of the red has changed. You're no longer getting such a concentration in the north of the borough. You can still see there was a, a little bit of a concentration, but nowhere near as much. Um, and then you are getting a few um, hot spots just, just around here. Um, and then if you're looking at this, uh, so obviously ward councillors take a, a understandable great interest in, in this, and quite rightly so. Um, and what you've found in the past was that those northern wards are where you had the really, really high rates. And they have come down quite significantly. So Stamford Hill West, um, Casanova uh, were, were right at the top. And this is um, slightly changed now. So there isn't quite such a big difference between those at the lowest end and those at the highest end. And where there used to be that very strong north-south split, it, it has it has changed. Um, and then looking at the, um, uh, as you mentioned, the Radio 4 interview, thank you very much for, for listening. I, I hope it um, came across reasonably well. Um, but I think what we have seen is some really good successes in our in our local contributions to test and trace. Um, it's, it's really been an intensive operation. Um, there is certainly, I think, a desire nationally to provide more opportunities for local authorities to take the role that um, City and Hackney have done. Um, and what you can see, I think, is the really good news is the target for the national contact tracing where it starts to have a, a really good impact is about 80%. And because we've been doing that fantastic work locally with the, uh, the, the, the contact team, we have been able to actually uh, get ourselves up towards that 80%. And so um, you can see that we are um, making a really good contribution in terms of the, the test and trace. And then this is the um, the data that you've already seen around um, care, care homes. So, and that, 
Go sorry. on. Sorry. No, you go. And then just in terms of, uh, I would sort of preempt questions by giving you um, answers, which I think you may um, be a little disappointed with. But obviously, there's an awful lot of interest in the vaccinations. Um, so really excellent early um, uh, findings about efficacy of the vaccinations. And, and that's fantastic news. Um, NHS colleagues have been planning really hard. Uh, there is still not yet all the information necessary to complete those plans. So, you know, when the vaccine will actually be licensed, when will it be delivered, which vaccine will come first, what will the order of vaccination priorities be, how much vaccine are you going to get in any one period, and then all the technical details around, you know, what temperature the vaccine needs to be stored at. Um, to give some reassurance that that work is ongoing, um, and it is planning at speed as, as fast as it, the information can be provided. But obviously what you're finding in the news is kind of almost the news releases from the uh, vaccine manufacturers and what people in the NHS um, and the local authority need is actually the much more detailed information that is not yet available. So um, really good early findings. And then the rapid testing as well. Um, I think there's been a really significant um, amount of uh, um, information in the public domain about what could be coming. Um, we are now uh, waiting for a little bit more detailed information from DHSC about when it is coming, what are the uh, tests, what are the requirements for the tests, uh, what's the license for the tests, so that we can then start planning um, how we're going to use those tests. But essentially, they should be able to provide us with a, a more rapid test um, result for people and it may be where we start to deploy for asymptomatic for people without, without um, COVID symptoms. But in terms of the existing um, local testing centres, the Stamford Court one, I think it is tomorrow, gets turned into a seven day a week, um, uh, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So that will increase the amount of testing capacity um, very much in the north of the borough. But we have got very good um, uh, capacity now in the local testing centres um, and the uptake of testing um, so people can, if they've got symptoms, go forward and get a test really easily. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Just on, on, on the new lateral flow tests, I think, uh, just in terms of upper tier local authorities, of which I think Hackney is one, there's been a just a recap for everyone, there's been some sort of understanding from the government that local authorities will get a certain number. I think I heard 10,000 banded around. I'm not sure over what period that was. And then you've alluded to it's unclear whether that will come with strings attached or whether it will be at our discretion. Is all of that roughly right? So, so certainly the announcement is um, initial uh, delivery of 10,000 tests. Uh, we don't quite know when that's going to be, but we think it will be 10,000 to begin with. Um, and then up to 10% of your local population, perhaps every fortnight. Um, and then what's not quite clear at the moment is actually do you need, you know, what what is the dynamics of how you're actually going to deploy those testing? So things like care homes, um, you know, GPs, perhaps social workers, are all people's uh, um, teachers as well, who, who you might think would be very much in that um, area where you want to do rapid testing and you want to test them quite frequently. Um, but at the moment, there is not an, um, the detail that we've, um, that we need to do that planning. So it's not just a hackney issue, it's across London. And then the other issue is we need to be really clear about the resources as well. It's actually quite easy to start doing something. It can sometimes be quite difficult to, to work out when is the best time to stop doing things. So we need to be really clear. Is this a pilot? If it is, you know, what are, what are they actually wanting us to, to, to pilot? Um, how long is it going to be for? Is there going to be additional money coming forward? And then enough information to enable us to, to plan the best way of deploying those tests. Thanks, Chris. Right, I've got, um, um, we're nearly at the end of this item, but I've got a number of questions. Can I ask everyone to keep their questions very brief? Um, so first of all, um, Councillor August Canley, then Councillor Gregory, then John Williams, and then Councillor, uh, and then and then Councillor Kennedy for comments. So can I take all four together? Councillor August Canley first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just two, two quick questions. One of them relates to north of the borough where we had some high level of um rates um are we expecting a spike there again and what is being done to prevent that and second question is about schools especially primary and secondary settings do we have any statistics or data about um schools and, and how we're doing in those settings thank you 
Thank you. Um, so next question, Councillor Gregory. Hi, thank you. Um, I wondered if we had a standard distance for people to get to a testing centre so that they could actually walk there. So, for example, that there should be a testing centre within 1.3 miles of where you live. Uh, I'm just aware that some, some of them are kind of quite far away from people and obviously we want people to be able to get there easily rather rather than avoid going because it's too difficult. And the other thing I wanted to ask, um, in terms of um, the impact on older people, um, I've noticed that a lot of older people tend to walk in the parks um, as their form of exercise, and you have a lot of um, joggers. I've noticed that now, uh, when joggers sometimes run past you, you can feel their breath on your um, face. Is there any data or information about the um, the risks and what we can do to mitigate them in terms of maybe having um, uh, runners run in one direction or different tracks. I just wanted to know if, uh, if you know anything more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gregory. John? You're on mute, John. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's about the police enforcement. Given we live in uh, Hackney's very diverse boroughs, and there's kind of yeah, COVID has kind of encouraged people to be more distrustful of institutions. I just want to know what the police are doing to open the community leaders to make sure that any kind of uh, harsher enforcement is kind of uh, well telegraphed and also made sure that we don't have any kind of conflict. Thank you. Um, thanks, John. Now, uh, Councillor Snell, I don't think you're asking for a question there. I've just seen on the comments, so I'm not going to go to you and. David, Councillor David, I think we're just corroborating. Um, Councillor Kennedy, do you want to come in with your comment and then I'll go over to Chris to answer those points. Thank you. It was very quickly to say I was on the call with the Secretary of State on Friday. Um, the uh, Q&A box, the predominant question in there was, where's the resource Secretary of State to help us deliver the lateral flow tests? Um, and all the comment he could make was, um, I hear you. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Kennedy. Um, um, uh, Chris, do you want to go through Councillor August Canley was north of the borough, preventing a further spike in schools. Uh, Councillor Gregory, 1.3 metres and uh, joggers and uh, John Williams, police enforcement. So um, slightly more difficult questions to answer than the ones that were asked on Radio 4, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so um, no north of the borough, um, it's difficult to, to predict what's going to happen. Um, there clearly was quite sustained high rates for quite a long time in the north of the borough. Um, a lot of work undertaken to improve the communication of messages, work with the community leaders, um, to do some enforcement to make very clear what the current regulations are. So um, I very much hope they have been successful. And, you know, each week, um, we, we hope to, to, to ensure that we don't continue to get those high rates. So let, let us hope that they, um, uh, the, the measures have been successful. And if they haven't, and if we do see the rates increase, then we will up the, um, the messaging and the engagement. Um, and as necessary, if the police feel it's appropriate, the enforcement as, as well. So um, let, let's hope that that continues to have, um, you know, essentially a good news story. Um, in terms of the schools, um, I, I haven't got the, the league tables. Um, I think uh, if you've got children in schools, you'll, you'll be aware that I think all the schools are having, um, uh, you know, school bubbles. Uh, certain um, uh, year groups will be will be sent home. Um, if if there is um, more information on schools, if there's some specific questions, I'm more than happy if, if you send those to, um, to us in the council. We can answer the questions. There is a very detailed um, spreadsheets and response that we have to schools and um, both the Department of Education, um, LCRC and ourselves have been working with schools to make sure that they've got the control measures. Um, and if we do get the lateral flow testing, schools might be a really good place for us to start thinking about how we deploy those, those rapid tests. Um, as far as access to testing centres, absolutely. Um, it is only just one of the ways that you can access a test. The other way is by going uh, online or phoning 119. Um, and actually asking for a test to be sent to you. They arrive pretty much the next day. You take the test yourselves, you arrange for them to be collected. But we have been looking at making sure there's a good distribution of the test centres in Hackney. And we've also got one now in the City of London, which is being used very well at the Guild Hall Yard. Um, so that there, I think, is actually for um, Hackney a very good 
I think there's now four testing centers that we, we have operating. So we, uh, we do believe that there are um, good access. Um, I'm sure there would um, be some residents who would still feel it's a little bit too far, but essentially if they are um, having difficulties accessing that test center, they can um, order a test online, it will be delivered to them. Um, so I think around jogging, um, you're absolutely right to highlight the issue that if people, you know, a lot of the transmission is through um, uh, the, the droplets, and if people are producing a lot more droplets, then potentially um, you can get that transmission. Um, I think some of the measures that you suggested around one way um, in parks for jogging uh, could be looked at, and we can certainly take that away and have a conversation with the relevant people in the in the council departments. Um, it is um, obviously something we encourage is people to get out there and do physical activity, but at the same time, you really do need to make sure that you've got that good physical distance from people. And if somebody's jogging and you're walking, then yes, probably a little bit more than two meters would would be appropriate if somebody's jogging and you know exhaling very heavily. Um, and then as far as um, the police, um, and I think uh, Councillor Kennedy's aware of the, the work that's been going on with this, and um, we have been sending out um, some very clear messages, uh, co-signed by the Environmental Health and the Acting Borough Commander as well, making it clear, essentially, if you're not going to comply with the regulations, then you will be running the risk of enforcement and the fines can be up to £10,000. And there have been fines that have been issued in, in Hackney and elsewhere. So I think um, it is always going to be uh, more that perhaps could be done um, and, and more that people would want to be done. But at the moment, there certainly is a very clear message um, that you know if you are going to breach these regulations, you are running the risk of, of getting fined. Um, and those fines are really quite substantial. Fine. Thank you, um, Chris. I'm going to um, call it there on that item because um, we're nearly out of time. So thank you very much, Chris, for your your team's hard work. Um, the, the final item on the agenda is um, a, a brief overview from uh, Denise as to the management restructure um, to adult social care. Um, Denise has provided a very um, helpful, succinct um, uh, paper item number seven in the agenda pack. Denise, um, we've got a couple of minutes. Are, are you okay just to very quickly go through the new structure for us, please? Yeah, hello. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, so when I arrived, um, Anne Canning was obviously the director, a statutory role for both adults and children, and obviously um, they were about to enter a consultation period about splitting the structure. Um, to be totally honest with you, I've in the main worked in a structure that's been just purely adults with that with the with the director taking on the responsibility solely for adults we had a trial once um in in the authority that i was with where we put children and adults together as lots of boroughs and authorities did but very quickly um split that role again that statutory role being held by by one person i think probably um and i've just got to look at my diary and i'm sure Anne's is the same the work that we have to do both in terms of our statutory work and just probably attending some of some of the meetings although you know Anne and I do still cover on in terms of duplication um, means that, it, that you know there's often different responsibilities Anne has a DFE and I have CQC um, and, and so I think what this new structure affords um, adults is a greater focus on it I think there's always a leaning when you've got adults and children a bit of a push for children um, and Anne won't mind me saying this when I first arrived and attended the management meetings the big focus was on the agenda items were on, on, on children's services because of, of the nature of the business and education whereas adults tend to sit down um, down, about, down the pecking order a little bit um, and, and I think also and we've started to have our senior management teams as, as I've now moved into that interim role with, with public health in, as part of that you know, we haven't got the director, the integrated director yet, director of integration. Um, a probably a slightly different conversation, and actually, because we can have more time, the opportunities are already coming to the fore where we can probably do things a bit differently um, and support each other in a different way. Obviously, there's always risks because, obviously, for public health, that that what it works for all departments it's got to work for the borough so we need to make sure um that sandra and um and chris and, and, and colleagues you know obviously keep that outward outward focus um 
but also for adults too you know there are synergies with with children services and especially around transition so again it shouldn't we must make sure we don't stop the the joint working um that goes on um and that we and, and we and we need to continue to learn from some of the best practice that's around so for me i think it's uh, and being here i think it's a positive move having as i say in the main only ever been a in the previous life director of adults um hats off go my you know to people that what we could call in the business as twin hatters um sometimes in very small boroughs that, that uh, and authorities that works but um for me i think it, it does just you know put that focus focus and i think especially now in these current times with both covid the pressures on the care system um per se as we've just heard about right at the very beginning um and, and also some of the rct issues at the moment as well i just think it's it's uh i think it's the you know probably the right decision um well, and I know it's the right decision. I, 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 I would want to be coming into Hackney as, uh, taking responsibility for both. So, yeah. Um, oh, thanks, Denise. And, and the Director of Integra Health Integration, that's definitely a, that's a two-year post. It, it wouldn't go beyond that? No, no, no. It's, got, it's, um, it's been fully funded. So I think in the, origi in the original DPR uh, that the Chief Executive put out, that was originally funded for two years. It looked like that was funded for two years. Um, but th th that's, that will be a permanent post. Um, and obviously okay. we're working with colleagues um, and, 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 and CCG, David and others, because it's, a, a it's been joint funded up until now, about how we shape that post to make sure we get the best out of that going forward. Great. Thanks for that overview. And there's a, there's a helpful slide just, um, just behind item number seven, um, which you've done, which sets out, sets out the structure. Yeah. Um, members, um, any questions arising from that in terms of the um, new structure or um, uh, can I bring that item um, to a swift conclusion? I think I can. Um, thanks, Denise, for giving us that overview. That's very helpful. Okay. Um, right. Um, there's, a, there's a point being made in the chat from Councillor Gregory in terms of the joggers, which is something we can follow up with um, um, mm -hmm. after the meeting suggestion. But um, in that case, I'll close the item um, of item seven on the management restructure. Item eight, can I take the meeting, the minutes as read, everyone, please? Thank you. Um, work programs at the end. 6th of January is our next meeting, so fresh out of the new year. Um, we're aiming to look at, uh, one of the items we're aiming to look at is something we've just touched on before in terms of the digital divide and possible lack of access in primary care um, and just really maybe to stress test um, whether everything's been done there. So with that, unless there's any other um, further points, I'll bring the meeting to a close. And thanks everyone for uh, attending. Thank you. Thank you.